Years ago, let me tell you a war story, okay? This, here's a, this is about the Gilbert family doing things they ought not do because they can't afford it. But back in 2001, uh, Stephanie was going to get paid on Friday, but we needed to leave a couple of days earlier than that to go visit her mom and dad, up, uh, mom and almost father-in-law, I should say, uh, up in Maine. So I thought, you know, sort of, kind of, but not really, Washington, D.C. and New York City and Philadelphia and all that, sort of on the way. I said, why don't we go over there? So the reason I'm telling you is that when we got to New York City, I had one $100 bill left. And uh, we spent about 25 of that buying some hot dogs at Battery Park. You got to get a hot dog, right, from one of them street vendors. And it was really cloudy that day, but I wanted, the main reason I wanted to go is I was like those people that visited Ephesus back in Bible lands. I wanted one of those little statues, but not a Diana. I wanted one of Lady Liberty, right? And so I wanted to go get one of those, and I wanted to see the Statue of Liberty and couldn't see it. The fog was so heavy. We couldn't even see the Twin Towers. The fog was so heavy. I've got video where we drove by them, but you couldn't, they couldn't see three or four floors. That's how thick it was. And so we went over to where you go to buy your tickets to go see the Statue of Liberty, and they were way more than I had. And I asked the park ranger there, I asked him how much it was, and he told me, and I was like, Phew. I said, man, we ain't got that. And he said, I said, come here. So I kind of got closer to him. He says, you see that big boat over there? It says Stanton Island Ferry. I said, yes, sir. He says, well, you can go get on that boat. It'll take you within throwing rock distance of Statue of Liberty and come back and it won't cost you a dime. So that's what we did. We got on that ferry and we went over and I got to see that statue. And I mean, you think about New York City, you think about Liberty. And then, of course, you got some People who don't understand liberty and misuse liberty, and the next thing you know, bad things happen. Folks think that liberty means you can do just what about ever what you want. We had just been there six months before that, and had gone to Washington D.C. and and all of that, and it was just uh, just absolutely devastating. You know, we're celebrating. Hope y'all like the ties. Only red, white, and blue when I had. I've seen so many of you ladies, this, even this week prior to this Thursday night, y'all were all dressed up like American flag, and I thought, boy, it's a shame. I don't even think I own a, a red, white, and blue uh, American flag, so I thought, I, I've got to find something. You think about the Declaration of Independence. Boy, there's so much uh, that I encourage you to sit down and read it sometime. Uh, I remember having to do that in school, but it had been years. We went up to Monticello, or Cello, as they like to say, and they got this room where you go in there and somebody's reading it to you and you read it on the wall. And that's about the only time I can remember having sat down and in one sitting read the statue, or statue, listen to me, read the Declaration of Independence. There's so much I could talk to you about that document. One of my hobbies, if you can, uh, or if you will, is looking at, um, you know, the be beginning of this country, why it was formed, how it was formed, and the men who formed it. And I've always taken a great uh, interest in that because the whole idea of independence, the whole idea of, of liberty, the idea of being free. I mean, uh, you know, I went in the army and I mean, everywhere you look, duty, honor, country. You know, I was proud to wear that flag. I, I was proud to be a part of the United States Army. And we've got such a beautiful and wonderful thing here that a lot of people spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort and risked their lives and some gave their lives so that we could have this precious thing called liberty. But unfortunately, some people don't understand what liberty means. Um, one of my not so fond memories is being with other, about uh, 2,000 other Georgia National Guardsmen in uh, warehouses in Atlanta during the Rodney King things, watching on television as the police and the state troopers were being just manhandled and mangled and their cars burnt. Now, this is actually from Seattle. And I watched that, and of course they, they had us, but they wouldn't use us. And if they had, there would have been a lot of things changed very quickly, but they didn't. And so you have some people who think liberty is license. I want you to look at some of these definitions. You can go, definitions, you can go to Webster's right now. That's where I got that this morning. The quality of state of being free. Well, that's great. What does that mean? The power to do as one pleases. That's what some people think liberty means. That's what they think freedom is. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. Folks, that's a fantasy. And it is not reality. You can't do that anywhere. 
You go outside and you jump on that freeway right there and you put the hammer down, baby, and you do all you want to do because you're free. The next thing you hear is them sirens behind you and see them lights, and all of a sudden, you know, you see that freedom's got some restraint. No, you can't go as fast as you want to. Everything has rules. There's a, there's a reason. There's a purpose behind it. Freedom from physical restraint. That's what most people think liberty is all about. And so notice the, uh, the D there. The positive enjoyment of various social, political, economic rights. We'd agree with that. And the power of choice. But it is not absolutely the power to free. Free to freedom to do what one pleases. And why do I bring that up? You know, whether you're a communist, whether you're a person who lives in America who enjoys the freedoms that we have, whether you live in a place that still has a king, or you live in some kind of other government system, whether you die and go to heaven or hell, doesn't matter what system you live under. You can be a good, faithful Christian in communist China. You can be a good, faithful Christian in whatever kingdom now has a, a king. You can be a good, faithful Christian in a democratic nation, a republic, if you will. That doesn't matter. But what does matter as far as your soul's security, as far as your life, your soul, is the Bible. It's the Word of God. And you see, some people look, and I appreciate Johnny and I reading this morning. We want to talk about what is liberty in religion because some people think it's license you do god christ has set us free i've even heard gospel preachers say that we're not under law today that's just simply not true the law of moses was abrogated upon the cross it was nailed colossians 2 14 to the cross but no man is free from law period or otherwise there would be no such thing as sin because what is sin sin is a transgression of the law we are under the law of liberty today, and I'm very thankful for that. Christ has been our freer, if you will, freedom from the bondage of sin, from slavery. But that doesn't give us a right to do anything and everything that we wish to do. Notice the very first scripture we're going to look at, Hebrews 5, 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I want to call your attention to this idea of learned for those guys that uh, like math, you're going to love this. That's where we get our word mathematics. Mathaneo. That's where we get mathematics. And so it means to learn. And so Jesus did what? He was a son, a wios. He was the son, but he learned. And what did he learn? A coup. It's the, the idea there is to hear under. It's called hupakao. Akuo is how we hear acoustics. That's the word for hearing and hupo means under. He learned to submit himself, to listen under, if you will, like a child. So Christ, Jesus, learned he obedience. And how did he do that? By the things which he suffered. Notice, and being made perfect, that's where we get our word teleos, the Greek word teleos, where we get like the teleological, how you explain the complete, if you will, argument. And being made perfect, he became the author or the, the one that begins, if you will, the eternal salvation unto all men. And there's that word again, that obey him. Yes, we are under a system of liberty. We're under a system that has grace. But there are requirements involved in it. Liberty does not mean that there are no rules. Freedom from the law of Moses doesn't mean that we're not under a law today. There are things that are required of me and you. So what does it mean to have liberty in religion? Well, first of all, let's look at what liberty we had in the old covenant. Remember the angels? Now, there's some pretty powerful folks right there. One of them was able to destroy just about an entire army in one night. These are the servants of God. These are the ones that stand in the very throne room of God, if you will. And what does it say about, what does Paul say about them? Though we, or an angel from heaven... Preach any other gospel unto you, and then that which has been preached, let him be what? Accursed, anathema. Then he repeats the very same thing in the next verse. You don't find that often in Scripture when almost verbatim is the same thing said twice. That's a significant thing. You see, the angels just can't say anything that they want to. Uh, notice uh, 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sin, sinned, yes, that's right. There were things the angels were to 
to do and not to do, and some chose to go against what God said. And notice they are cast down to this place called hell. Now this is, a, I think it's one of two occurrences, if I'm not mistaken, but it's a different word than we usually associate with Gehenna, the, the, the burning hell, the devil's hell, or even Hades, the place of departed spirits. This place is called Tartarus. But cast them down to this place, and they're being held there in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Doesn't sound like they had a freedom from everything, does it? Revelation 22, John saw these things and heard them. When I'd heard and seen, I fell down to worship the angel. And what does the angel do? He tells him to get up. He says, I am a fellow servant. An angel is just not at liberty to do anything that he wants to. And I think that you and I would probably say that angels high, uh, rank higher than you and I do as men at this point. I think that might be a little different down the road uh, uh, in, in eternity, but we'll, we'll see. But for right now, we know, and they're not at liberty to do just whatever they choose. Notice what kind of liberty the prophets had. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1 at verse 21. Prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man. Men just didn't dream it up. I did, Isaiah just didn't sit down and say, you don't think I'm going to write this down? No. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, inspiration came from God. They just didn't write down whatever they wanted to. So even the Balak, who we know what a situation that was, who... Said unto Balaam, remember, Balaam has been hired by Balak. He wants them, him to curse Israel. And Balaam says, you know, I can't do that. Uh, he says, I t notice he said, I took thee to curse mine enemies, and you have blessed them. And what did Balaam say? You know, I've got to do what God tells me to do. Even though later we learned that he indeed uh, did tell him how he could make Israel not be so good, if you will, tempt their men with their women is what he did. 1 Kings 22, Micaiah, notice what he says. Ahab, Ahab has called for him so he can, you know, appear before Jehoshaphat. And Ahab's wanting Jehoshaphat to go to war with him. But what does Micaiah say? As the Lord liveth what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. He didn't have liberty to just say anything he wanted. He was under a certain rules. You think about the young prophet in 1 Kings 13, one of the... Tragic stories, I think, in all the Old Covenant. It just makes you so sad. This, this young prophet, he does so many things well. He goes into that king's room, if you will, into the, the very room where he's in there offering up sacrifices. He's at the altar. And the young prophet tells him exactly what God told him. Very dangerous. The king says, seize him. Remember, he sticks his arm out and his arm withers. He can't even bring it back in. Immediately the king goes like, oh, I'm, I know what I'm dealing with here. And so he says, pray that my arm be restored, his arm restored. He says, I'll give you half my kingdom. The young prophet says, can't do it. He says, I, when I came here, God told me to come straight here, tell you this message, and leave by another direction, not stop. He says, if you, no matter what you try to give me. See, that young man was, man, I, that took courage. And he does everything right till he decided to take a break. And an old prophet came to him and lied. Do you remember Told him, well, God told me to tell you to come home with me and have supper. Cost the young man his life. Doesn't sound like he had a whole lot of liberty to do whatever he wanted, does it? Of course, he did not. Think about what kind of liberty Jesus had. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, you know, he became the author, the creator, the beginning of salvation, if you will. John 12, 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should... Jesus is just not down here doing whatever he wanted. There was a plan, and he was following exactly what God said he should. And notice in 8, 28, Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man... Remember, John tells us, this is him talking about how he's going to die. He's going to be lifted up, crucified. Then shall you know that I am he... And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. It amazes me how Jesus says, I've got to do this. This is what I have to do. I have to leave. I have to die. I have to, so the Comforter can come. All these things that I do, yet you have Christians today and say, yeah, I think we can do whatever we want to. The Son of God couldn't do whatever he wanted to. He couldn't just say, liberty, I'm under liberty. No. I'm going to destroy the old law. I'm going to nail it to the cross. It doesn't mean there's not things that have to be done. Here the Son of God is doing that very thing. You think about 
how much liberty the Holy Spirit had. John 16, 13, what does Jesus say? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come? Notice, uh, boy, I tell you what, brethren, I, I don't ever want to quit reminding people of this because so many people are confused about the Holy Spirit. They think the Holy Spirit is just like an essence. He's just out there doing this, doing that, making you do this, making you do that, giving you this idea to go here, go there. What, how be it when he, the spirit, notice it's a he, just like Jesus is a he, just like God is a he, and we use that pronoun, we're, we're, it's a person, they're, they're individual, they have a personality, if you will, they're all a part of that Godhead three, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, remember that's why Jesus had to leave, so the spirit could come, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever uh, he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Even the Spirit of God had something he had to follow, the plans that they had laid out, the scheme of redemption, if you will. Remember, that's what uh, Peter will appeal to in, in Acts 2, verse 16. He says, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet of Joel. So the Holy Spirit had Joel 700 years earlier write down this prophecy beginning in verse 16. Peter's going to quote it. I'm sorry, beginning in Joel 2, 28 through 32. Peter's going to quote that in verse 16 and 17. He says, and it shall come to the pass in the last days. Exactly what Joel wrote. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And they're not just going to prophesy whatever lands on their mind. It's going to be given unto them by the Holy Spirit. That was in the first century. But when that which is perfect has come, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I won't belabor the miraculous give and they were going to end and how you used them. Brother Blackwell did a good job with that when he was here. We preached on this just a couple of weeks ago. But you don't have, they didn't have the liberty to change the message. As a matter of fact, one of the gifts was to listen to the guy who was prophesying and make sure what he said was right. And they just wasn't made something up. Test the spirits, John would say. See that they are from God. You see, that was one of the gifts. To be able to say what the guy stood up and said was actually what God said. And so even the Holy Spirit was under rules. He had to do certain things. But what about us? How much liberty do preachers have today? Well, unfortunately, a lot of them think they have a lot. In reality, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Notice 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. That which is written. A man may get up and say and have. I've got books in my office. I've got books at home of people who said, you know what? I was cruising down and guess what? Man, God talked to me. Laid it on my heart. And this is what he said. Joseph, you need to take your flock west. and Go to Utah or something like that, I guess. And so there we go. And he also told me that, you know, old brother so-and-so, you need his wife. Do you believe that? A man said that God told him that he needed another one of those people that he was preaching to his wife. And you know what he told the man? God said, I'm supposed to have your wife. And you know what the man said? Here she is. Amazing, isn't it? Well, who would ever think that that would take place? But then you have the beginning of the Mormon religion and you just have wives, you know, forever. It's amazing. I've got books where people say God took them to heaven and took the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. And said, there it is. That's what you guys have been missing out. So she says, now that's what we're supposed to do. And people, sounds good to me. And I'm sorry. That's another gospel. You know, and what's so bad is Joseph Smith there said that an angel told him. An angel by the name of Moroni. Unfortunately, Paul had already cleared that matter up 1,800 years before when he said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. What? Let him be anathema. So maybe our problem shouldn't be with Joseph Smith. It should be with that false angel Moroni, right? Anyway, above what is written. Today, when a man stands up and tells you, well, all you need to do is believe in Jesus and say the sinner's prayer. And by the way, they'll all have different versions of that prayer, even though they've kind of tied that up, there's kind of, and you're like, man, that, that sounds great, but is that which is written? Where do you find that in Scripture? Where do you find this church or that church or this way of salvation or that way of salvation? People have just 
Don't even pay attention to what is written. Sometimes when I'm studying about our country's origins and beginnings, I think, what would the founding fathers have thought about that fellow, and I can't think his name was Larry Flint, Flynn, Flint, something like that, that would use the Constitution of the United States to try to say that that gives him the right to produce pornography. Do you think that would have flown very well in 1789? I think something might have flown in 1789, but it wouldn't have been that. Or who would say that the document that you know, all men are created equal and we should have pursuit and happiness and everything doesn't really uh, apply to an unborn child? That that tomato growing in that, where would that come from? And so I look at that document as it's written, and then I see where people say, well, that's not what it means. Let me tell you what it means. And isn't it amazing? Everybody's got a different idea of what that means. And so they take this document that's supposed to be like a foundation, if you will. Most folks today don't even know what it says. They have no idea about the Bill of Rights, couldn't tell you about the amendments. We just don't pay much attention to it because we're letting somebody else do that. We practice that in our citizenship. You know what? It's not been a good thing, all right? But not many of us want to jump in the game because we look and we say, man, the game's so corrupt, how would you know? And so, you know, I can die being in a corrupt governmental system, you know, that's over me and go to heaven. I can do that. I can be a faithful Christian no matter what folks around me and above me and over me are doing. But when it comes to my soul salvation, I need to know a little bit more than just what the fella in the pulpit says. And I realize that's talking about me. Oh, what you do. Oh, please don't base your eternal destiny on the words that come from these lips. You need to base your eternal destiny on what is written. What does the book say? And I can't take you to a passage in the Bible that says all you need to do is ask Jesus into your heart by saying this prayer because it's not there. I can tell you that the Bible says that if thou believest with all thine heart, that thou mayest, and what did he say? Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I can give you book and chapter and verse on that. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I can take you to what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. I can take you, let you read it in the inspired word of God that is written, that was written by inspired men and say, base your salvation on what God has said. Not what Ron Gilbert has said. I can take you and show you passages where the Bible says that, you know, you need to repent. We said 238. We talk about Jesus, Luke 13, 3 through 5. So that's something that you know that you need to do because you can read it because it is written. And so let's don't think above, about preachers above that which is written. Also, 1 Peter 4, 11, the Bible says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou also unto faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. That is our authority for preaching schools, for colleges, because we're teaching people how to teach others. Galatians, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1, that didn't come out right. It's supposed to be 4, 1 there with 2 Timothy. He tells him to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching and ears will heap to themselves false teachers, <clears throat> not having a love of the truth. Galatians 1 and 8 and 9, still there. Though we are an angel from heaven, apostle, Paul, preacher, one of the finest that ever lived, says, if I preach something other than what's been preached, I'm anathema. All men, you think about that for a moment. All men, what kind of liberty do we have? The Bible tells us straight up that in Jeremiah 10, 23, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We need God. 2 John 9 through 11 says, if any come unto you and preach not this gospel, uh, don't have fellowship with him. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Proverbs 14, 12, the heart. Psalms 119, 104, talking about the law. That is what it is written. All men, all of us have an obligation to do what God would have us to do. You know, we talked earlier, you know, we were talking about uh, Absalom and him not preparing his heart when he was younger. Uh, that's something that a lot of times we, we don't think a lot about. 
Uh, and I'm glad uh, that we have folks who are concerned about the youth. But do you realize that a young person in the Bible is anybody about the age of 40 or under? Do you know that? That's amazing, isn't it? Why are you laughing at Dakota? I'm 59. I'm out of it. I'm out of it. I used to use that a lot when I first started preaching. Yeah, it's young people. Not anymore. But for, you know, up to about 40 years, you could still consider a, a young man, biblically speaking. And in, in Ecclesiastes 12 says, you know, as a young man, prepare yourself, you know, uh, to seek God, you know, to, when you're young. Uh, and then he goes on and starts talking about the things that happen to you as you get older. There, you, when you're younger, you have that energy, you have that vigor. Uh, but as you get older, sometimes it's just about all you can do to wake up in the morning. You know, it's just hard to get going. And so, uh, you know, when you're young, take advantage of that very thing. And notice, how do we have liberty today? It's by following God's plan. Liberty from sin. Acts 3 verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins be blotted out. How do we get rid of our sins? We repent of them. We obey the gospel. And God, now this is a parallel passage. This is the same. It's a different day. But Peter's just preached Acts 2, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is a parallel passage. What's he saying? The next day he says, repent and be converted. So guess what baptism is? It's the process where conversion takes place. When God says that you're no longer a sinner and pronounces you justified. And it is he who has done the work. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. That your sins may be blotted out when the time's refreshing shall come. Notice as well, liberty from error. You think about Paul and Apollos. Remember they just said, you know, hey, don't think above men that which is written. We shouldn't do that. You know, and there's an interesting thing there. Because you had a situation where Apollos at one time didn't know the truth. He, he, had knew, he knew the baptism of John. That's something else we could spend time with. But when John came on the subject, came on the scene, you remember what his job was. His job was to make straight, prepare the way for the Lord. And he was preaching the baptism for the remission of sins, but he was preaching before the time of Christ. That's why it's referred to as John's baptism. And so John doesn't know about the New Testament baptism or the commission of Jesus going to all the world, make disciples and so forth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He hasn't got that far. He's still... He's zealous about John, what John was preaching. So he's out there doing that. But that time has come and gone. And so the people in Ephesus don't know about the Holy Spirit. And we find that out when Paul goes there because he goes and he's probably observing the worship service and realizes there's no gifts represented there. You know, and he's like, uh, have you guys not received the spirit? And they said, we've not so much as even heard about spirit. And he says, well, why did you obey the gospel? You know, why have you been baptized? And they said, we were baptized under the baptism of John. And you know what he did? At that point, he preached unto them the baptism of Christ. And they said, no, we ain't doing it. We've already been baptized. We ain't going to do it again. No. To the man, every one of them obeyed the gospel. They, bab they were baptized for the mission of sins under the, New under the New Testament commission. And what happened to Apollos? Well, he just happened to meet a husband and wife team, if you will, by the name of Priscilla and Aquila who were doing some preaching and teaching, and they heard Apollos uh, preaching, and they said, you know, uh, there's some uh, things there that he's not quite so right on, so they pull him to the side, and they teach him the way of the Lord more perfectly, and as a result, Apollos became a, an even greater worker in the kingdom. Isn't that a great story? How that sometimes uh, you may not know what is right. You mean well, as a young person, I love Jesus. As a real young person, I was scared to death of hell. <laughs> As an old person, I'm scared to death of hell, but not like I was in a kid. You know, I heard a few of those sermons, you know, that just scared me, you know. I didn't want none of that. <clears throat> and so I did everything that I thought, you know, I asked what I should do. I was told what I should do, so I did that. And then later on, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about things. And I hear a gospel preacher, and he starts talking about the church. And how that when one obeys the gospel, the Lord adds him to the church. And then he starts talking about the fact that there is but one church. Well, I was like, okay, first of all, that ain't nothing like I've been taught. You know, I, I've never heard all this before. But I know one thing. Where I go has 12,000 people. And I'm looking here and I see about 50. What makes you guys think that you know the truth? And I don't. And you know what? The old preacher there, he smacked me upside. No. 
he was kind enough to get his Bible out and start coaching me up a little bit in the foyer. And I was 15. I knew everything, everything. So I'd coach him up. But he kept pulling that Bible out. And he kept showing me what Jesus said. He kept showing me what the apostles said. And then I'd go home and say, that can't be right. And so I'd call some folks and I'd get some more arguments. Yeah. Then I'd meet him again the next Sunday in the foyer and we'd go at it. Everybody would leave, and there we were still good. I know my mother-in-law and my future wife, they were very patient because we stayed over a lot of time. And he worked, and you know what kept coming up? The Bible, the Word of God. And it took about six months, but I was like, why am I fighting this? You know, one day that was the reality of it. I'm like, that's exactly what Jesus said. Why am I trying to say that ain't so? I love Jesus. I want to do what Jesus said. And that sure enough makes sense right there. Jesus says it here. Peter says it there. Paul preaches it there. And they do it all through the book of Acts. Why would I fight that? And so sometimes we might find ourselves learning things that we didn't know before. And we can go back and the God of heaven gives us that time to grow. He gives us that time to mature. And then it's laid on our feet. What are you going to do about it? And so what I did about it, I, I obeyed the gospel. And even though I had been in error and had been dipped in water before, I was dipped in water to show everybody else that I saved. You don't find that in the Bible. I was dipped in water so I could be put on the roll of that particular place I was at. You won't find that in the Bible. I was voted on by the people that put me on the roll there. You won't find that in the Bible. And then I was told once I had it, I could never lose it. And as a young person, that's something I always had a problem dealing with, even when I was 10 years old, that I could be saved and never lose the, that salvation, no matter how I behaved. When every page of the New Testament that I would read had some requirements that God was telling people they needed to do, I thought, why all that verbiage if none of it means anything? No, don't allow yourself to be carried away in error and think, well, we've got liberty to believe whatever we want to believe. That's not how the Bible works. That's not how God works. Liberty from eternal destruction. Well, that's really what it's all about, isn't it? <clears throat> First Peter 4, verse 17. This come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. What do you think it's going to be like for those who've never obeyed the gospel? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. And those of us who are troubled rest when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire with his mighty angels, taking vengeance on them that obey not God. Or believe not in God and obey not the gospel. That's a, a heavy price to pay. Notice with me, if you will, 1 Peter 2 at verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Well, how are we going to do that? Peter, I appreciate Johnny reading that this morning. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. You see that word free? It's the same word used for liberty. You see, we may be free. We may have liberty, but that comes with responsibility. I'm not at liberty to say anything that I want to, preach anything that I want to, and I am not free to act any way I want to, to obey the gospel any way I want to, to just figure out my own way of salvation. You see, it's not freedom to make choices. God's already made those choices for him. Our freedom comes in the fact that we can do what God has said, or we can refuse. Notice Galatians 5, 13. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You've got liberty. You've got liberty to be what God would have you to be and to be that kind of servant that God would have you to be. Notice verse 14. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, you're talking about a passage that's so hard to live up to. No matter my skin color, no matter my income level, no matter my <clears throat> whatever I am, an American, a Mexican, a, a communist, or what, all people. I am to love all people. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try to coach people up and help them out, but at the same time, I'm to love all men. That's very powerful. Think about the plan of salvation. God has given it to us. He says, you've got to understand who I am and that the great sacrifice that was made for you, 
believe that I am God, that I sent my my only God and Son. You have to believe this. That's called faith. And remember, faith's not just something you check off. Yep, got that. I believe in God. No, faith is a dynamic. It's, yes, it's the beginning process, but it never stops. You can't just one day say, okay, I've got faith. I'm done. I'm just going to do on something else. No, faith. Act upon that. You've got to believe it. John 8, 24, if you believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. Requires repentance or a change of life, a turning to do what God would have you to do. And you might say, I don't need to have a lot to repent of. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not saying you are. But the idea of repentance, the changing of mind, means not living how you want to live anymore, but living how God would have you to live. And that requires some, some knowledge. That requires knowing what God would have me to do. Confession, audible confession that indeed Jesus is the Christ. Don't leave off baptism. Jesus didn't. Peter didn't. The apostles didn't. You need to do what the Bible says. And don't let men talk you out of that. Just because they had a big war about it 500 years ago. It's called the Protestant Reformation. Don't let that battle, that war, should we be sprinkled as babies or should we not or it's all us or no, it's all faith. No, the truth is God's laid out some requirements and it's your obligation to see what those are and obey them. It's that simple. Don't let some hatreds <clears throat> of centuries and these battles determine your destiny. You read the book. You see what God would have you to do.